So we've heard a couple people make reference to this, and this is the t statistic that really kind of smacks you in the face. Um, when we're talking about people with serious mental health conditions, they're dying on average 25 years younger than their non-mentally ill peers. And when we saw this statistic, it was one of those, yeah, that's one of those statistical things. But the more studies you read, that's on average. Um, there are some studies that show 30 plus years. And so that's a really significant issue for our folks and something that we really wanted to make sure we pay attention to. There's a lot of studies that have tried to look at what are the reasons for people dying so young. And I happen to be showing a slide from Ohio because we're in Ohio. Um, and so wanted to really kind of show us some of these, the top 10 reasons that people are dying. And as our previous folks have kind of alluded to, if we look at the top 10, we can see how many of these are modifiable risks, things that we can do something about. Cardiovascular disease, cancers, respiratory diseases, diabetes, cerebrovascular diseases, as well as some of the mental health interventions that we might be able to do. So we wanted to take a look at what we know about that number one cause of death, which is cardiovascular disease, and really look at what are the known risk factors. And so this is just across the board, risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease include being a smoker, being overweight, having high cholesterol, having diabetes, and having high blood pressure. So wanted to take a look at kind of the disparity that exists between people with behavioral health issues and the general population for these risk factors. First one, tobacco use. People with behavioral health issues have a tobacco use rate 75% plus compared to the national average for non-mentally ill, which is just below 20% now. Steadily over the years, we've seen the number in the general population decrease um, from about high 40s, 50% down to just below 20% nationally, whereas in the behavioral health population, it stayed pretty steady at around 75% and higher. Let's look at BMI and overweight. So if we look at the way these bars are set up, the yellow bars are people who don't have schizophrenia, the red are people who do. And so we look at the higher bars, which are showing higher rates. And so we see in the underweight and acceptable range is where the general population surpasses people with schizophrenia. As soon as we cross over into the overweight range and the obese range, that's where we start to see again, people with schizophrenia overrepresented in this high risk of having high BMI. So what about diabetes? Again, we have statistics that will tell us that people with schizophrenia have higher rates of diabetes and across different age ranges, you can see the different um, rates within the different age ranges. But again, across the board, higher rates for diabetes than people who don't have behavioral health issues. And it's a cumulative effect. So it's not just one plus one plus one plus one. The more risk factors you have on board, the higher your risk is of developing um, cardiovascular disease. And so we can see this is from the Framingham group where they show single risk factors just by themselves what the risk factors are, but then when you have more of those. And so we've already talked about that our population has high rates of smoking, high rates of obesity, high rates of diabetes, high rates of hypertension, um, as well as cholesterol, which we didn't have the slide on. This is a more recent study that looked just at, again, people with schizophrenia spectrum, and they looked at people who had been in a state hospital over a 10-year period who then eventually died. And so, again, they tried to look at reasons for death and what were some of the causes. 43% of the deaths in smokers versus 19% for non-smokers. This is the thing that kills me. The odds of, of it being a cardio... Uh, Cardiac-related death, so heart-related death, was 12 times if the person was a smoker versus not. So this is within schizophrenia. This is not even looking general population compared to behavioral health. This is within people with schizophrenia, 12-fold increase that the death was caused by tobacco use than people that didn't use tobacco. So absolutely, I think, or I hope by now, people would be nodding their heads in agreement that these are some significant risk factors and some pieces that are really causing high rates of morbidity and mortality in our folks. 
And these conditions are either directly related to or exacerbated by their tobacco use. And so absolutely a piece that we want to make sure we're paying attention to. I'm going to turn the podium now over to my colleague, Dr. Christina Dallas Reyes, and she's going to take us few, um, through a few more pieces of our information here. I hope my mic is working. Um, good afternoon to everybody out there in, um, here at NeoUCOM and out in cyberspace. Um, I also don't want to mess around too much with uh, this thing because I might accidentally shut us off. But for the people that can't see me, I am wearing a hat that says smoking sucks. And that's the reason that I'm here today. I'm very passionate about this topic. And I hope that by the end of this three hours, you will be equally as passionate. So I'm going to take the hat off now. OK, so here's the facts. And the facts are that 44% of all the cigarettes that are um, smoked in this country are actually smoked by people that have a psychiatric illness. And that is a stunning um, fact, and it's one that never ceases to amaze me every time I see it. And as we already saw on a slide, the smoking prevalence in the seriously mentally ill is triple that of the general population. And when you look at how many cigarettes are smoked per day, 68% of the people, so well over two-thirds of people with schizophrenia, are, can be defined as heavy smokers. And heavy smokers means that you smoke 25 or more cigarettes per day. So that is greater than one pack, one pack plus. Um, people that have um, schizophrenia versus people who do not actually get more toxic exposure per cigarette. So not only are they smoking more cigarettes, they smoke a larger portion of each cigarette. So yeah, that's why they have all those burns on their fingers, because they smoke it all the way down. 27% in one study of a person's income was spent on cigarettes if he or she had schizophrenia. So the, again, those are huge um, and sort of devastating numbers, as Dr. Sherman alluded to earlier. Okay, so here's some reasons for intervention. Tobacco use and addiction are common in individuals with psychiatric problems. It's at least twice the rate if you have any mental illness. It's triple the rate if you have schizophrenia. 50 to 60% of people who are defined as clinically depressed smoke. Um, smoking rates, depending on what study you read, smoking rates can go as high as 90% for individuals with schizophrenia. So yeah, it's very uncommon to come across a person with schizophrenia who does not smoke. And I think everyone around the state would agree with that. Uh, people with schizophrenia who do smoke, interestingly enough, experience the following things. They have more psychiatric symptoms. They have more psychiatric hospitalizations and they use on average higher dosages of medications and that's kind of holding all other things equal so to me again that's very interesting data people who smoke every day are almost twice as likely as those who don't smoke to have suicidal thoughts and behaviors and again this holds true even when you adjust for psychiatric illness so there's definitely something about the smoking that is causing you problems on the psychiatric end of things Let's take a look at how smoking um, lines up with alcohol and the use of other drugs. So when we look at um, the substance alcohol, we see that smokers have two to three times higher risk for alcoholism. And then if you look at the converse, approximately 80% of alcoholics actually smoke. So, I mean, certainly when you used to go to AA meetings, you'd have that sort of cloud hanging um, at the top of your room. That doesn't happen as much um, anymore, but certainly 80% of alcoholics do smoke. And um, from what I understand, what killed uh, Dr. Bob and Bill W. was actually their smoking-related illnesses and not their alcoholism. So just something to consider. Uh, if you look, take a look at other drugs, and by that I mean illicit drugs, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, etc., the smoking rates are one to three times higher in um, persons with drug addiction than in the general population. So when I, when I teach this class, I always say it's like peanut butter and jelly. Where you see the one, you see the other. How does it affect relapse from addictive illness? Okay, so we already have established that if you're a smoker, there are increased rates of alcohol and other drug dependence. But what you may not know is that folks that have an alcohol and other drug addiction that also smoke 
actually will experience a higher rate of relapse in their alcohol and drug use. And I think there's lots of neurobiological reasons um, that that could be the case. And if you look at the converse side, when a person is trying to quit using alcohol and other drugs, and they're also trying to quit smoking at the same time, there's, a, there's several studies out there now that show that if you quit both alcohol and other drugs and tobacco at the same time, you're 25% more likely to achieve long-term abstinence on the alcohol and drug side. So to me, that's another very important thing that I think when I was in school, I was taught the exact opposite, which is you shouldn't um, try to quit everything at once and, and don't, please don't take their cigarettes away. And, and I think more and more as I learn more about this topic, um, the opposite is actually true. Okay. Uh, some people, I think, still have, and this includes patients, staff, administrators, etc. Some people still have this idea that nicotine dependence is not really a disease, and therefore we should treat it differently than we treat alcohol and illicit drug dependence. Um, and actually, if you look in the DSM-4, and I'm sure the DSM-5 coming up, nicotine dependence is in fact an illness, just like all the other addictive illnesses. So it has the same exact definition as alcohol dependence, as marijuana dependence, as cocaine dependence. Basically a maladaptive pattern of using a substance that leads to impairment or distress, as shown on this slide. So people with nicotine dependence have tolerance, they have withdrawal, they have unsuccessful attempts at cutting down, um, they use more than they want to, they spend a lot of time in their life getting cigarettes, using cigarettes, or perhaps recovering from the bronchitis and the coughing that they get from cigarettes. Many people that smoke have to give up important activities or things that were, you know, they become formally important activities. And certainly, um, even though your doctor may tell you, boy, you really ought to quit smoking, boy, this is going to cause you a lot of health problems, um, many, many smokers continue to smoke despite knowledge of adverse consequences. So if you ask me, I think nicotine certainly is a brain disease like any other addictive disease and ought to be treated as such. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, it means that this is a chronic disease, so it's not something that you cure once or that you quit once and then you never have a relapse. This is a chronic condition that's going to require repeated interventions over time. The good news is that we have effective treatments that can produce long-term abstinence. If you take a look at all smokers, this isn't um, smokers with mental illness, this is just all smokers. If you take a look at all smokers, 70% of smokers report that they want to quit. So it's not as though we don't have a willing audience. We do have folks who want to quit smoking. Most smokers want their treatment providers to ask them about smoking and to offer to help them. So, so why don't we is the question. Um, here is a short list of some of the reasons that we don't do it. Um, we're busy. We have other issues to look at. And certainly for those of us who work with the seriously mentally ill, we have to face a laundry list of issues such as being homeless, such as having problems with the legal system, such as not having enough food to eat, such as not having any medical coverage. And therefore, when we get down to the smoking, it's like, oh gosh, just another thing to have to deal with. So um, we may say that, quote, other things are more important, but I don't know what can be more important than your life when you're getting down to it. So I tend to look at this issue as a life or death issue because smoking will kill you 20 years earlier than most other things that you'll do. Um, many of us have a lack of training or expertise, not something we learned in school, grad school, medical school, etc. cetera. Um, many of us are pessimistic. You know, we can get the person to quit drinking, we can get the person even to quit smoking crack, we can get them to stop shooting IV heroin, but they don't seem to want to quit smoking. So we sort of have this um, nihilistic view that, eh, they're not gonna quit anyway, why should I bother? Um, so I think there's a lot of that pessimism that goes on. Uh, some people, and I hope you don't agree with this anymore, some people think this is just a bad habit as opposed to an actual illness. Um, certainly, there is a culture in the mental health community which is starting to change. There is a culture that says, you know, hey, this is a free country. If my 
patient with schizophrenia wants to smoke, that's his or her choice. So while I also respect patient choice and I respect a patient's right to do what he or she wants, as a physician, I'm obligated to also say, hey, this is not good for your health. Um, and I at least am obligated to let them know that there are ways you can actually address it. So I think there has to be this rebalancing of priorities as far as patient choice versus patient health. Um, some folks um, take a look at uh, patients who smoke and say, hey, they self-medicate with nicotine. They need the cigarettes to calm them down. Um, they need uh, this to help them concentrate, etc." Well, again, there's a lot of other things in life that you could do to help you calm down or to help you concentrate that don't involve 6,000 carcinogens. And so again, I think it, it behooves us to start to think of it in, in a different way. Um, the last reason, which is probably the most difficult reason on this list, is, hey, I'm a smoker myself. So it's quite hypocritical for me to tell my patients to quit smoking if I'm still smoking. And um, interestingly, I, I don't know if I could quote you the chapter and verse of an article, but I would bet that smokers are overrepresented in the human social services um, <laughs> departments around this state and around this country so that a lot of the caregivers of people with severe mental illness are also smokers. And so that, that last bullet on this slide is of particular importance. Okay, so let's dwell for a moment on the so-called positives of tobacco and nicotine and how that relates to serious mental illness. This has been known probably for what, 15 or 20 years, that the molecule nicotine, okay, we're not talking about smoking tobacco per se, we're talking about the molecule nicotine, that nicotine actually improves sensory gating and cognitive symptoms in schizophrenia acutely. What does that mean in English? What that means is that a person with schizophrenia for that five to 10 minutes after they smoke that cigarette maybe feels slightly more organized and slightly better able to take in all the different stimuli from their environment. Because people with schizophrenia have problems with all the information that's coming in to them. And it's also, interestingly, same problem that folks with autism have, that, that un inability to filter all the information coming into your five senses. So nicotine on an acute basis, a short-term basis, improves that. So some people argue, okay, here's, here's an argument for nicotine. The other thing that we know about nicotine is that it acts as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and therefore, theoretically, it could have an antidepressant effect. So the argument then, and you see if you follow me, is that, well, we don't want to take away something that, quote, is potentially helping the client. And so this has implications for when the person starts to cut down or quit. However, and this is the but, tobacco itself is untested for all of these effects. What we do know, which is unquestionable, is that it'll kill you. You know, that stuff will kill you. There are much safer treatments available in order to help you think more clearly. And point of fact, I told you that it helps with the sensory gating and the cognitive deficits acutely. But what about the long-term effects on your cognition? And the long-term effects on your cognition, as you may imagine, is decreased memory, decreased problem-solving ability, decreased thinking speed, and even lowered points on your IQ. And this has all been sort of put out there by Dr. Antonelli and Dr. Glass and some other scientists. Um, when you take a look at the brains of alcoholics who smoke versus alcoholics who do not smoke, the alcoholics who smoke have shrunken brains. They have cerebral atrophy compared to alcoholics who did not smoke. And my simple explanation for it is that the nicotine, you know, basically it constricts your blood vessels, so it's constricting the amount of oxygen that's getting to your brain, and, and over a long period of time, you get the cerebral atrophy. Okay, back to the sticky issue of, you know, we said that 70% of regular general population want to quit smoking, but do psychiatric patients really want to quit smoking? And we've known as long ago as 1994, a study done by Buchanan and colleagues, that the answer is an unequivocal yes. And in this study, they actually looked at a, a very tough population, and that is state hospital patients. In one study, 90% of the state hospital patients actually smoked. When they 
they queried the nurses and then they queried the patients separately. When they talked to the nurses, the nurses said at a, at a level of almost 90% that they believed that the patients were not interested in quitting smoking. But then when they queried the patients, almost two thirds, so that's very close to that 70% that I quoted you five slides ago. Two thirds of people with severe mental illness in a state hospital said they would use help from a nurse if it was available. And the help that they were looking for is help with cravings, help with psychosocial, you know, how do I get over um, the behavioral elements of smoking. So they, they said they would accept help. So, but here's where the attitude is very important. If you don't think that people want help, well, gosh, you're not even going to bother, right? So the attitude is, is actually where um, it starts. Okay. Now, my last little point here before we, we move on to the actual um, tobacco products. This is another sticky issue for many patients, both male but especially female, is the weight gain. If I quit smoking, you know, the last three times I tried to quit smoking, I gained 20 pounds and I don't want to go through that again. Okay, what do we know? What are the facts? If a person quits smoking cold turkey, the average weight gain, which means that some people will gain more, some people will gain less, but the average weight gain is 10 pounds at six months. Now, if you wanted to have the same health risks caused by continuing to smoke for six months, you would have to gain 90 pounds. So this may or may not work with your clients, but it certainly impressed me, and so that's why I said, we gotta make a slide about this. Um, you'd have to gain 90 pounds in order to get the same health risk caused by continuing to smoke for those six months. So, you know, maybe the 10 pounds is just something that you might have to learn to, you know, deal with. And in fact, you can deal with an extra 10 pounds. We all know what to do, right? It's just doing it. Okay, so um, this is my last slide here. Um, tobacco may interfere, and smoking tobacco in particular, Smoking tobacco may interfere with the metabolism of medications. That means that folks will need higher doses because as the tobacco smoke and, and all of those chemicals revs up the metabolism um, drive of your liver, it also revs up the metabolism and the breakdown of all the other medicines that you're taking. And so you may need a higher dose. Um, and then what happens is that because you're taking a higher dose, you put yourself at risk for all of the dose-related side effects which is what we've been alluding to, the weight gain, the diabetes, the sedation, etc. Tobacco smoking also increases insulin resistance, which adds to the problem of diabetes. Tobacco is highly associated with other substance use. And of course, tobacco always, the use of tobacco always has implications for um, after the person leaves the hospital. Since all hospitals have moved to being, all, almost all hospitals have moved to being non-smoking, um, what happens is that person is going to be discharged on one dose of medication. They're going to go back. If we, have, if we do nothing, if we don't intervene, they're going to go back and start smoking the same amount of cigarettes they were smoking. That's going to make their level of medication go down. Um, on the reverse end, if somebody's trying to quit smoking and we've already got them on a high dose, say, you know, 40 milligrams of Zyprexa, because that's what they needed while they were smoking, if they now quit smoking, you know, they're going to see all of that 40 milligrams of Zyprexa, which, which has its own implications. So those are all the reasons um, that we really need to keep this front and center um, in our minds. And it's time to turn it over back over to Deb. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. And again, we can't stress this part enough because this piece is, is the main focus of why we need to make sure that behavioral health folks see this as our job. Um, it's very easy to look at the high rates of diabetes and the high rates of cardiovascular disease. Well, yeah, that's primary care and that's all those people over there. But the more we really start recognizing the need to integrate our care and make sure that we're addressing what we need to address for folks in a holistic way, this is where we really need to look at what are the implications and what does this mean? Because you can't separate behavioral health interventions from the other pieces that are going on. And so if one behavior, tobacco use, one addiction, tobacco dependence, is then impacting our behavioral health interventions, we need to make sure that we're aware of that and we take that into account as we're trying to work with folks.